There's been a lot of hullabaloo this week about the GOP platform and what it, quote, means to leave it to the states. Um, obviously, after Dobbs, the states have much more leeway to protect our tiniest Americans inside their borders. We've seen a number of them move to protect women and babies, and I applaud those states. And I, you know, I think we all pray that that trend spreads one day to every state. It appears that there is little courage or appetite among our national leaders to try to protect unborn Americans with new federal laws. But that doesn't mean that existing, long-standing federal laws can be totally flouted. There are too many radical policies implemented by Team Biden throughout many agencies to let any new president or cabinet secretary off the hook. So while I think it's quite clear that Biden himself has absolutely you know, zero to do with the routine work of governance, his army of bureaucrats and political appointees have been quietly transforming every agency into Planned Parenthood. Y'all are probably too young to remember Oprah, you know, you get a car and you get a car and um, like every agency, like your Planned Parenthood and your Planned Parenthood, everyone is. Um, so every cabinet secretary who comes into a new, hopefully Republican administration, will have a pro-life agenda that they must enact. And so this idea that we could just leave it to the state is nonsense because we've, we have a federal leviathan that is killing our babies. So if there is a second Trump term, and I certainly hope there is, I want, hear me on this, okay? I certainly hope there is. Um, he was the greatest boss ever, my favorite boss, and I've had great ones. Um, but if there is a second Trump term, those policies, which Team Biden has implemented, many of which were issued after Dobbs as a workaround to Dobbs to preserve Roe's radical abortion policy in pro-life states, those will all have to be reversed. And there's simply no avoiding it. So let's just take a little merry-go-round around some of the agencies. So your local emergency room is now Planned Parenthood. According to HHS, they have this lawless reading of what's called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. We love acronyms in healthcare, so we call it EMTALA. But this law requires emergency departments to stabilize emergent patients, regardless of their ability to pay or if they have insurance. This is all good. It's why when you go to an ER, you know, the little girl with the card asking about your insurance comes into the room after your visit is well underway, as opposed to at the door where normally you get asked those questions, right? In the emergency room, they have to just start treating you and ask you those questions later. We like that. I think that's probably good policy. Um, but Congress made it abundantly clear that yes, emergency rooms, you do have to treat people, but you also have to treat unborn people as well as their mothers. It's literally explicitly stated in the law. So what does Biden's HHS do? The exact opposite, it issues this directive that um, actually ERs are required to perform abortions and state laws that protect unborn Americans are preempted by our new novel interpretation of EMTALA requiring you to do abortions in the ER. Now, thankfully, this was just issued in guidance. Subregulatory guidance is not binding. I'll get a little bit into that later. Um, so that's your ERs, Planned Parenthood. Guess what? Your local pharmacy is also Planned Parenthood. Shortly after Dobbs, HHS issued sort of hysterical guidance to pharmacies across the Fruited Plain that the law banning discrimination on the basis of sex and therefore pregnancy status and termination of pregnancy status, like, or something, means that those pharmacies operating in states that protect unborn Americans must stock and dispense abortion drugs anyway, even though their state bans those drugs. Okay, so another way your local pharmacy is Planned Parenthood is that it can now sort of dole out the abortion pill like candy. And it used to be that this dangerous drug uh, was required by the FDA to only be administered after a physical exam by your doctor and in the presence of that doctor. It also required a follow-up visit so that women weren't just bleeding out on their bathroom floors. Even the FDA admits that this happens, the bleeding out on the bathroom floor, it happens so often that up to one in 20 women who take that drug will end up in the emergency room, <laughs> where of course the abortion will be completed because now they're required to. Okay, so it's time to take seriously the dangerous risks of this powerful toxic chemical brought to us by Big Pharma. FDA can and should easily 
use the data it already has, and it's insufficient, I'd like more data, but the data we already have, we can use to reimpose safety guardrails that were imposed for 20 years by a Democrat administration under Bill Clinton before radical pro-abortion presidents removed those safeguards one at a time. Obama first, and now recently Biden. I would strongly urge any hand-wringing politician worried about suburban women to read the FDA label before advocating for pill pushing on demand. The next woman bleeding out in fetal position could be their daughter or their granddaughter. Without these FDA safeguards, the US Postal Service has also become Planned Parenthood, as Tom alluded to earlier. So USPS is being issued, is being used to sort of issue and ship abortion pills into states whose laws protect unborn Americans and elsewhere um, across the fruit of plain again. This is in flat violation of federal law. Tom talked about this. There is law that says, you know, organizations are not allowed to ship abortion pills across or other devices and equipment used for abortions across state lines through the Postal Service. It would be quite easy to catch this happening with a little undercover telemedicine visits where these, are, these pills are being uh, prescribed. So this is not hard to stop. It's not hard to shut down. It just takes will. I'm not sure we have that will, but this is uh, on the agenda for a pro-life administration. Veterans, did you hear that the VA is also Planned Parenthood? So every VA hospital, part of the largest healthcare system in the world, is now the nation's largest abortion chain and one that does not have to follow the rules of the state that the hospital's in respecting unborn Americans. But wait, you say, doesn't federal law prohibit the VA from providing abortion? Yes, it does, silly textualists. But DOJ claimed that this law has been, quote, effectively overtaken by VA's preference to do just whatever it wants. So if President Trump really believes that states should be sovereign when it comes to laws protecting unborn Americans and their mothers, then these lawless actions by the Biden administration that seek a Dobbs workaround thwarting pro-life state laws simply must be reversed. In each case, the reversal could be justified by the agency announcing that it's actually recently read the law and arrived at the conclusion that its previous actions were inconsistent. Now, guidance issued by agencies is the sub-regulatory guidance. This is like words that this is how we kind of are going to newly interpret some laws, and we hope you all agree, and we'll do what we say. That's guidance. Guidance issued by agencies is the most common method that Team Biden has tried to end run the law. And the reason is that sub-regulatory guidance is really kind of hard to sue over because technically it's not binding. So you can't really sue you know, the government for telling you that maybe you should think about doing something, and we kind of think the law says this, and we hope you do too. But the good news about that is that guidance is easy to reverse. The agency simply withdraws it, and status quo ante prevails. Regulations, on the other hand, are more difficult and time-consuming to reverse. So the Administrative Procedures Act requires a whole protocol when it comes to justification for rulemaking, robust notice and comment, responding to every comment, doing cost-benefit analyses and other related analysis and so forth. And generating comments to these proposed rules has become a common pastime of activist groups on both sides of any issue. I mean, I think our side is finally getting much better at this, thankfully. Um, and every comment must be reviewed and responded to in any final rule. Now, this process can and often does take years to get from initial proposed rule to a finalized regulation, and even longer to survive judicial review when opponents sue. We had a, um, a phrase when I was in the White House that, you know, our, the lawyers would often come to me and be like, Katie, you can't do that. The statute isn't quite enough. Like, I think the courts would probably reverse it. And I'm like, but what happened to my pen and my phone? I thought we had a pen and a phone. And they would say, no, no, you know, the, the butt chump legal theory will will harm us in this case, and meaning when we pass something totally, we, we issue a regulation that's completely lawful, com totally consistent with the law, um, but Trump, so nationwide injunction, right? So um, that's the legal theory that it, it makes it harder for us. Um, we have to be more law-abiding. We have to be more careful than the other side because 
Trump. So um, getting through that process of not just the rulemaking, but also the judicial review means that you have to start on day one, and it doesn't end until the very end of the administration. So let me give you an example. Um, Section 1557 of the so-called Affordable Care Act, which prohibits discrimination in health care on the basis of all the usual protected classes under the Civil Rights Act, under Title IX, a few other laws, so age, disability, race, national origin, or sex. These are the usual protected classes. You can't discriminate on those bases in health care. So that's a big sentence. It means a lot of things. But um, naturally, our friends on the left have asserted that freedom from sex discrimination obviously means the absolute right to abortion on demand whenever, wherever, and by whomever you choose without regard to anyone else's constitutional rights to religious exercise or any conscience protections. Um, so the Obama administration immediately after the ACA path became law immediately issued a rule interpreting that provision, that non-discrimination provision, as you know, the right to abortion on demand. Catholic hospitals, of course, sued and won. Um, the Trump administration, when we came in, we, we had to reissue that rule in light of this court order that now this rule was under a nationwide injunction. So we had to fix it um, and you know go back to saying sex means sex. Um, but of course, the Biden HHS recently finalized their rule reversing that position. So one thing to think about is when we came in, we started the process. That final rule was not finalized until September of 2020. The Biden people, in reversing it, just finalized their reversal of it. So it took four years in both cases. That's how difficult rulemaking is and how long it takes, especially when wonderful groups, you know, issue a zillion comments to a, a, when it's being issued to a bad rule. That's great. I think it's wonderful. But it does require a lot of work, even when it's your rule and you think it's a wonderful rule. Um, so it just takes a long time. And, you know, this new rule under the Biden Section 1557, non-discrimination, has not even been litigated yet. So, um, you know, we're not even done with the process. Um, I think we'll see lots of litigation on it, in fact. So a second Trump administration could simply return the serve in this game of ping pong and issue a more originalist, again, interpretation. Um, however, you know, it takes a long time. So everyone needs to start early. And so I'm grateful, I'm grateful for some of the efforts made by outside groups to try to plan and prepare and help any new administration um, when they get started. They're gonna need all the help that they can get. Um, one thing I'm kind of looking forward to seeing unfold is kind of the manifold ways that the regulatory process will benefit from the use of AI. And so um, I know that people are already kind of talking about this and thinking it through. For all I know, the Biden folks are already using it. But you could have AI summarize public comments. You could have um, AI, you know, draft the first draft of lengthy legal treatises that, that become the preambles of these regulations um, that are used to justify regulatory changes. You can have um, AI start the process for cost-benefit analysis in a regulation. Many more applications I probably haven't even thought of. Of course, you know, I guess that's the point of AI is it, it's thinking of things that we can't even imagine yet. But at least, you know, AI cannot replace humans um, and should not. But, well, maybe they can. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it can one day. But, um, in the regulatory process, it should not. Okay, this is an important point I want to make. But I think it might help, and um, certainly with initial drafting. So I'll be interested to see how a new administration will will try to speed up some of that time frame using um, a little bit of AI to help. Obviously, humans finalize rules. So let me be clear. I'm not okay. Now, for Democratic administrations, and I want everyone to kind of understand this because I think our team thinks oh, they're going to get in, and it's just going to be like, boom, boom, boom. We're going to have nothing but winning. We're, we're going to be tired of winning. Um, and so with Democrat administrations, the regulatory process is a lot easier. And they're so much more productive. And the reason is the entire agency becomes your army to execute the president's most radical agenda. Republican administrations have a much harder time. We tend to come in and, you know, we have like a couple reg writers who are our political appointees. There's like a handful of political appointees at an agency with hundreds of thousands of employees. And, um, you know, maybe one or two of those appointees is sufficiently experienced to write regulations. Um, 
They can't seek any help from you know, experienced but hostile bureaucrats that surround them, or those drafts get leaked, or bad advice gets provided, and poison pills get put into regs. Um, drafts get slowed down or scuttled altogether. So this dramatically limits the productivity potential of a Republican administration. And I think there are some ways that we can overcome this. So I'm hopeful that you know there will be many, many, many more appointees in the next administration than were in uh, the first Trump term. There's no need to limit ourselves. Um, and there are ways to do this. So I'm hopeful that they'll use that tool. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of tools, I think, that might make, you know, the second term even greater again than the first term. Um, and I hope, that's, I hope that's the case. I'm going to stop there for now, and we can start to do Q&A. Thanks.